Well, I think that challenges that face neuroscientists over the next few years uh, are questions that we've really known about for a long time. So things like the physical basis of consciousness, uh, what it happens when we appreciate a piece of music or when we perform a complex cognitive task. Neuroscience has the interesting quality that it deals with phenomena from, from a very low level like reflexes and say regulation of the heartbeat and of respiration up to the most complex things we do such as uh, appreciate music or even generate music. So the questions have been around for a long time. I think that what is going to be happening in the next few years is that neuroscientists are going to start uh, addressing more and more complex phenomena and dealing with phenomena at different levels and starting to understand phenomena at one level in terms of the levels, say, immediately below it or immediately above it. And I think that connecting of different levels is something that's going to eventually encompass many kinds of human behavior, uh, including, for instance, disciplines such as psychology, which is where a lot of these questions began. Well, in the next five years, it's not so clear that we're going to be getting to the finish line on any of these questions. Um, but I think the thing that, things that we can look forward to in the next five years have to, do with developing, have to do with developing technologies to monitor brain activity, for instance, at a very fine level, so developing technologies to watch groups of neurons working together to generate some interesting behavior. And so there's a lot of just uh, discovery mode. A lot of sciences in their early phases are in what I would call discovery mode, where you develop a tool and you look and you see what's going on in there, and then that gives you a starting point for starting to build more sophisticated theories. And right now there are a lot of fairly complex theories that have been built up at a theoretical level, but what's really needed is to develop the tools, I think, to start linking those ideas with the actual physical events that happen in brains. One of the most misunderstood concepts about the brain is something that people think they know about the brains. You can go anywhere in the world and find some people who believe that we only use 10% of our brains. This is a widespread belief, um, and it appears to date back to the writings and teachings of someone who is definitely not a neuroscientist, the motivational speaker Dale Carnegie. And in the preface to How to Win Friends and Influence People, Dale Carnegie won readers and influenced book sales by saying you only use 10% of your brain. Now, there's a seed of truth in that. Uh, obviously, we would all like to make maximum use of our brains, and certainly there's always room for improvement. But somehow he turned that into this image in which 90% of our brains are, I don't know, packing peanuts or something like that. And that's categorically not the case. So that's one example of, uh, of a false belief about the brain. Um, Another fact about the brain that people uh, often do not appreciate is that the brain is not a fixed object. It can change throughout life. Early in development, it's getting wired up, connections are being made and broken, and cells are being born. And then later in life, we, our brains change in, in response to our experiences. I, I think people who are watching me right now uh, are going to undergo perhaps some short-term change, and if I was effective, then a long-term change in response to things that I've said. And this happens throughout life, and I think that that's something that's maybe not fully appreciated. In any given day, you need your entire brain. If something bad happened to part of your brain, uh, and you had, for instance, a stroke or some other kind of uh, damage to part of your brain, it would become manifest as some kind of symptom. And so it appears to be the case that eventually you need your whole brain. And, uh, and perhaps parts of your brain might not be active for periods of time, but eventually it comes into play and you'd, you'd miss it. One thing that happens in response to experience um, as we learn and remember and acquire new skills uh, is that the way we use our brains will change. So for instance, uh, it's been observed that uh, amateur musicians, when you scan an amateur musician's brain, perhaps a largest part of, uh, of, the, of the part of the brain that con controls fine finger musculature might be active, but in professional musicians, as be they become more practiced, then the parts of the brain that are active in, uh, in those very practice musicians becomes more refined. And you can actually see smaller bits of brain active. And so there's some kind of retraining that happens when people become very skilled at a thing. And so there's rewiring, remodeling, and you can see it um, at the level of scans of brain activity. Neuroscience research often has revealed facts that are at great variance with, with what people believe about their brains in everyday life. Um, for instance, there's the idea that people only use 10% of their brains. There are many ideas like this in popular culture. Uh, other ideas include uh, the idea that if you play Mozart to a baby, then she will become smarter. 
or if you drink alcohol, you're killing brain cells. There are a lot of these ideas, and if you probe around in people's popular knowledge of, about how they think their brains work, it turns out there are a lot of these ideas. And over the last uh, few decades, and even the last 100 years, neuroscientists have come up with a lot of results, some of which are very well known to neuroscientists that fly in the face of these popular beliefs. And what's interesting is that people don't know about these ideas, despite the fact that, I don't, as a neuroscientist, I don't know, my thousand closest associates and friends in neuroscience all know the answers to these. And more importantly, they know, all know that everything I just listed is in fact a myth, not true. And so there's this whole body of knowledge that I think people would be very interested to know about, about th ways that you could make your, uh, help your child become smarter, uh, things that do kill brain cells, and how much of your brain you do use. And those things are exciting, and it would be wonderful to see those ideas replace the myths. If I had to come up with three things that I thought that everyone needed to know about how their brains really worked, um, they would be this. One is that your brain is not a computer. It's not a hard drive. Your eyes are not like cameras. Your brain is a device that's evolved over millions of years to help you survive, and it doesn't necessarily tell you the truth about things. What it does is you, it gives you enough information and gives you a capacity to react to the environment around you and live to fight another day. And what that means is that what you think is accurate is not always the case because your brain is trying to help you survive, not know exactly what the position of every object in the room is. Uh, the second thing that people ought to know about their brains is that their brains are plastic. Brains can respond to the environment. Um, this, of course, is a necessary part of how our brains operate. And so from birth to old age, our brains are constantly changing in response to the environment. The third thing about the brain that I think is a practical matter is that uh, is that the brain is, like other parts of your body, is an organ. And what that means is that you can treat it like an organ and you can keep it healthy by doing things, for instance, that are good for your cardiovascular system. So for instance, as people get older, they may be concerned about how to take care of their brains. Uh, one thing they can do to take care of their brains is to lead an intellectually engaged lifestyle. And another thing they can do to take care of their brains, perhaps counterintuitively, is physical exercise. The, the ways that physical exercise are good for the heart and circulatory system are also good for the brain. So for instance, getting on the treadmill is a thing that appears to be good for the brain for reasons that are not entirely worked out yet, but the abiding principle appears to be that things that are good for your heart are good for your brain. And that's true for everybody.